Advil is a very common over-the-counter medication, but is it actually as helpful as we think or could it be doing more harm than good? We're gonna answer these questions and take a deeper look into Advil. All right, before we get started, I do have to throw this out here. This is not medical advice. Do not use this as a substitute for professional medical training, for professional medical consult, or for the instructions on the back of a pill bottle. I'm just another guy on the internet offering some information, so uh, do your due research and don't use this as your medical advice. So today we're taking a look at Advil. Now Advil is a very common over-the-counter medication and chances are you probably have it in your house, probably in multiple places. Uh, you throw it in your briefcase, backpack, keep it in your car. People use this all the time from uh, minor pain, joint pain, swelling, inflammation, um, and even as an antipyretic for fever. But let's take a deeper look into how this actually is functioning in our body and see if there's some adverse reactions or some side effects or sometimes when we might not want to take this. All right, but first things first, let's talk about the generic name, brand name, class, and dosage for this medication. So the generic name for Advil is ibuprofen. So there's a lot of other brands that make ibuprofen, including some house brands that Walgreens and other places will put out as well. But Advil is one of the more common name brands that you see. So generic name, ibuprofen, and then you'll see brand names like Advil or Motrin or other house brands as well. This medication falls in the drug class as an NSAID, a non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug. This medication's in the same drug class as aspirin, which is the last medication that we did, but there's some slight nuances that make this a little bit different. Now, as far as dose goes, for an adult, a dose is typically 200 to 400 milligrams. Once you get into the prescription side of things, you may see 400, 600, or 800 at any given time as it's prescribed by a physician. Typically, it's recommended not to take more than 800 milligrams in about six to eight hours. So you need to wait that time frame before you uh, redose and take another dose of that medication. As with any medication, we wanna take the lowest dose needed to get the job done. So if we can decrease the pain with 200 or 400 milligrams, we wanna to try to do that rather than taking a prescription dose of 600 or 800 because that's extra medication in our body now that doesn't need to be there and any of the side effects from this medication could now be made worse. So we want the minimal threshold to be able to achieve the desired effect without throwing any extra medication in our system. One more thing on dosing. Sometimes you'll see this used along with Tylenol to treat fevers, especially in kids. So you'll see the uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol mixed with uh, ibuprofen and they're given every four hours. So you'll do a dose of Tylenol, four hours later a dose of Motrin, Tylenol, Motrin, back and forth. Um, but that still, as you're dosing that now your ibuprofen dose is still ending up every eight hours so eight hours is that kind of that window you want to shoot for uh, before you take another dose of this let me pause for just a second and say that if you find something in this video helpful leave us a like on this video that would really help us out and if you have any questions over any of the stuff that we're talking about today or even ideas for future videos that you would like to see leave us a comment below we'd love to hear from you and if you haven't already hit the subscribe button and make sure your notifications are on so you're alert of future videos that we post. All right, so chances are you've probably taken ibuprofen at some point, or maybe you even take it fairly regularly. It's a great medication to be able to treat fevers and pain, and pain specifically due to swelling or uh, injury of our uh, muscles and joints because that pain is coming from inflammation at those injured areas. Now, quick recap on some physiology. When we injure ourselves, our body starts to uh, protect that area and start to heal that area. As it heals, our vessels will now dilate. They'll get bigger in that area to increase the circulation to that area. As those vessel walls increase in size, the wall of the vessel actually increases permeability. So now there's fluid that can pass through those vessel walls. That's how we get things like white blood cells from inside our vessels out into those cells that are injured to be able to heal those areas. There's a lot of other things that pass through that vessel wall as well. But one thing that we need to keep in mind here is that when we have an injury, we have swelling. Now that swelling is a normal response to be able to heal the injured area. 
but along with that swelling typically comes pain. Now pain is a great receptor because pain will let us know, hey, something's going on at this area that we should be aware of. But it does make for a much longer recovery rather than being able to turn off that pain receptor and simply just have the swelling happen without us having to know about it. So while the swelling is necessary for healing, sometimes the pain gets in the way of everyday activities and things that we need to do. So that's why we typically take something like a Advil or an ibuprofen to be able to reduce a little bit of the swelling, give a little bit of ease on that pain so now we can go about our everyday life. Let's take a little bit deeper look into how Advil works in our system. So if you remember from our aspirin video, if you've seen that one, we talked about how these things called prostaglandins are responsible for pain, inflammation, swelling, um, and ultimately some of the healing properties that we also get at these injured areas. They're also responsible for things like blood clotting and increasing the uh, mucosal layer inside your stomach. So if we are trying to stop the pain and inflammation from an injury where there is swelling, we probably want to stop the swelling. And by stopping that, if we can stop those prostaglandins from creating this big mess, that's ultimately what we need to accomplish to be able to stop that. So there are these things called cyclooxygenase, and there's different types of them. They make different types of prostaglandins. Without getting in the weeds too much, that cyclooxygenase is what we are trying to inhibit by taking either an aspirin or an Advil. Now, the difference between Advil and aspirin is that aspirin is actually an irreversible binding agent. So it binds to that cyclooxygenase and does not allow that cyclooxygenase to produce prostaglandins. So now we don't have prostaglandins to continue to add swelling and pain and all those other things that we're trying to get rid of. Once that aspirin binds, it does not come apart. That cyclooxygenase enzyme ends up dying off, the body creates new ones. So if you want this sustained effect, you have to take multiples over and over again, but that is a non-reversible or irreversible binding. Advil, on the other hand, can bind, but can also come back off that cyclooxygenase. So Advil is not a permanent binding. So it is not gonna remain on the cyclooxygenase for the entire life of that enzyme. So that's the main difference between aspirin and Advil. They're both NSAIDs, but one binds reversibly, one binds irreversibly. So let's trace Advil through the body. As we take an Advil, we pop it in our mouth. We swallow that and it goes down into the stomach. The stomach acid starts to dissolve this pill down and break it down into something that can be more absorbed in our body. It then moves from the stomach into our small intestine. As it goes through the small intestine, the vessels on the outside of the small intestine absorb this medicine into the bloodstream. It goes from there into the liver. Um, because Advil is not metabolized by the liver, most of that passes through the liver um, without getting uh, metabolized. It comes into our systemic circulation, goes through our body. It affects the uh, cyclooxygenase and prostaglandins directly at the point of our injury, but also everywhere else in our body because we can't just have it pinpoint one area. It's in systemic circulation now. So the cyclooxygenase is blocked, prostaglandins are not produced as readily, and now we don't have quite as much swelling, hopefully decreased pain, or even decreased fever um, if we're running a fever and that's why we're taking the Advil. If you want a little bit deeper look into uh, how this works with cyclooxygenase and prostaglandins, there's actually a really good video that's only a minute or two long. I'll leave a link in the description down below so you can take a look at that and that helps break that out pretty easily. Then as this uh, medication continues to get distributed through our system, eventually it's going to get picked up by the kidneys. The kidneys are going to filter it out and you're going to excrete that as urine. And that's how your body will cycle through and get rid of things like medication in your body. Keep in mind that different medications um, are processed differently. So some are processed in the liver, some pass through the liver uh, without actually getting processed much. So each medication works a little differently in how the body actually metabolizes it, breaks it down, and ultimately gets rid of that medication. All right, so let's talk about a few side effects that could come from taking Advil. So one of the 
big side effects with taking Advil, and specifically a lot of Advil over an extended period of time, would be a decreasing in our mucosal layer in our stomach. If you watched our video on aspirin, aspirin does the same thing because it's an NSAID and it blocks those prostaglandins. Remember those prostaglandins are responsible for producing that lining, that mucosal lining in the stomach, and that's what protects your actual stomach from the very acidic stomach acid that's inside. So if we block those prostaglandins, then we don't have a good mucus uh, lining in the stomach. The stomach acid can start to eat at the stomach itself, and then we can end up with things like ulcers. Along with aspirin, Advil also will prevent some blood clotting or slow the process of blood clotting. Again, prostaglandins, help with blood clotting. We've blocked those, so now we're delaying that blood clotting. So if we block that prostaglandin, have a decreased mucosal lining in the stomach, end up developing an ulcer, and then we have some bleeding from that, well, now we also have difficulty with our body being able to clot there as well because of the effect that the prostaglandins or the lack of prostaglandins has on our clotting cascade. This is also an important point for someone that has Advil in their bag for adventure medicine or for uh, going hiking or camping. If you have an injury with bleeding, Advil may not be the drug of choice because now we are prohibiting some of the body's natural means to be able to clot and stop the bleeding at that injury. So if you're giving Advil as pain relief after you have a deep gash or a large cut that you had a hard time getting the bleeding to stop, if you get Advil, then you may have further problems with trying to get that bleeding to clot. So especially if it is a severe wound that you're treating, don't try to treat that pain with aspirin or Advil because that can make problems worse. So as we mentioned a minute ago, the kidneys are responsible for getting this medication out of the body. But this medication also has a little vasoconstriction effect in the kidneys, which decreases some of the blood flow in the kidneys. Again, a small dose of this here and there is not going to have a huge effect on the kidneys. But a large dose over and over for an extended period of time could end up decreasing blood flow to the kidneys. You could have further kidney problems, especially if you already have some type of kidney disease. Then on top of that, you could have secondary issues like blood pressure or heart issues from that. Did you know that your kidneys are largely responsible for blood pressure regulation in your body? Fun fact there. So keep that in mind if you're taking large amounts of Advil on a regular basis. It's not exactly the best for your kidneys or your stomach. All right, one more precaution. You do wanna be careful taking Advil when you're pregnant because that will cross the placental barrier so that medicine can actually start to affect the uh, baby inside. So you do wanna make sure that you're taking caution there. Talk to your uh, OB or a physician and make sure that that's right for you before taking it when you're pregnant. So as we ultimately answer the question of, is this medication helping me or could it be actually hurting me? I wanna remind you that your body has natural God-given responses to be able to heal itself. We have swelling, we have fevers, and we have pain receptors for a reason. But we do live in a fallen world and our bodies are susceptible to diseases. And it's a great comfort to know that we have modern medicine and a lot of advancements to be able to help uh, even with some simple things such as comfort during some of these injuries or disease processes. So yes, Advil is a great medication, something that you should have at your house, something that we pack in a lot of our first aid kits, and something that can be very beneficial for fevers, for injuries specifically related to swelling and uh, localized joint or muscle injuries, but you also have to be aware of the side effects. Don't take it when you're pregnant unless your doctor says that it's okay and is monitoring what doses. Make sure you see a physician then. Don't take this if you have active bleeding or bleeding problems. Again, consult a physician there and make sure that this medication is going to be right for you. And also understand that if you take a large amount of this medication for an extended period of time, you could have secondary issues such as stomach problems, kidney problems, ultimately high blood pressure or heart problems from that. So make sure that you are following the manufacturer's recommendations for dosing. Consult your physician if you have questions and make sure you are using this responsibly. Well, that wraps up today's talk on Advil. Hope this was beneficial. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.